what's up, brother? It's your boy, Mike Muse. Welcome to the Conversation with the Mike Muse Show. I am so excited to be in conversation with my next guest. Uh, I've had the chance to watch this gentleman's career, and I've been a huge fan of this uh, for so long. I mean, you've seen him from every single program on television uh, to Broadway. I mean, all the way from the, uh, the Five Bloods to Scandal. Um, he's done Jesus Christ a Superstar, uh, currently Women of the Movement. Uh, on Broadway, you've seen him, um, and once on this island, chicken and biscuits. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the first black man to be the Phantom of the Opera, uh, and so much more. And I've seen him from afar. And then I had the privilege, uh, I guess you can say the privilege in the silver lining, I have to be mindful how I say that, during COVID, uh, to get a chance to get to know him personally uh, through a mutual friend of ours, Richard. Um, yeah. And uh, Norman Lewis is just such an amazing human being that is decent uh beyond his talent and his vocal ability and so ladies and gentlemen the mike me show it's an honor uh that i welcome norman lewis to the show what's happening norman hey how are you and, and muse right I, I wrote the check out perfectly right muse yeah, m-u-s-e yeah, yeah. you got it yeah 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 as long as you get the right story that's all that's all i could ever ask for norman um but this day and age man audience i was confident you'll see this when it goes up on youtube uh, for those of you have to wait until youtube uh, norman is matching perfectly with his bookshelf behind him i mean norman how, how did you do it i mean tell well, me your thought you know, process behind that after you know reading all these books uh it's it's <laughs> <laughs> And then looking at the color scheme, I said I had to throw on something that looked exactly like one of them, you know. I mean, one of us is winning here. I mean, audience in my backdrop is a basic hotel room of like some pictures, some art decor that I wouldn't have suggested. But nonetheless, we are here. Uh, Norma, congratulations, man, on all your success. Uh, I've had the chance to be with you personally, but I think I've always told you personally how much I've been a huge fan of yours, but I would never... I want a moment of opportunity to go by without acknowledging what an awesome talent that you are, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're very kind. I'm just, I'm very blessed. And, you know, there's so many people out here that are, that are killing it. And, uh, you know, I'm just happy to be in the mix. Yeah. You've had that kind of career. And I, I love, in my audience, knows I actually love talking to directors over thespians, but there are from thespians that I'm just obsessed over and you're the one. Uh, what is left, I mean, for somebody who has such a storied career, I mean, you've done, you've done it all. I mean, to be such a historic role, are you able to take artistic liberties now um, as you go forward with your career and selecting the type of roles and things that you want to do? I, I think that there's a little bit of that. I have a little bit of uh, some choices I can make. You know, there are certain things that I can say, yes, I will do, yes, I won't do. Uh, and I have done that in, in some cases, but, you know, in, in the beginning, it's one of those things where you just kind of take everything because not only are you trying to fulfill your artistic side, but you're trying to pay the bills. Uh, yeah. but, but luckily, I'm, I'm in a position right now where I can I can make, you know, I can go, you know what, yes, I'm, in, I'm willing to do that or no, I'm not willing to do that. Yeah. Does it ever get old on you uh, or lost on you, the fact that you're the first Black Phantom? I've always wondered that about you. I never had a chance to ask you over dinner, but I'm always curious about that. Does it ever get old? Or? Well, you know, the thing about it is that, and I always do this, I'm one of those people who will say, I'm the first Black Phantom on Broadway. Um, Robert Guillaume was the first Black person, Black male, to play the role, and but it was in Los Angeles back in 1990. So I stand on Robert Guillaume's shoulders oh, and, uh, you know, forever indebted to him. Uh, along with other of my colleagues, you know, uh, Ken, Kenny, uh, Ken Page and, and Andre DeShields and all these great performers who are still out here killing it. Um, but I, I do take that title seriously, and uh, I'm honored to have that. I'm lucky to have it because, like I said, any of my colleagues uh, could have been the first Black Phantom. I just happen to be the lucky one that, that they chose. Um, but it means more to me that people see me as this person that now they can see themselves in. I've had people, you know, after the show, when I was doing Phantom, come up to me and say, now I feel like I can do it. And they were from China, Brazil, wow. Italy, and, you know, places like that. Of And they had, you know, dark hues. That's beautiful. I yeah. actually had the chance to go back uh, when Broadway reopened. So I was there for Phantom to help reopen Phantom. And right. I, I was sitting there um, and I couldn't help but think of you. Um, as I was watching his performance, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I've always talked about Broadway on the show. Um, and so 
to be able to watch that type of production and know that set it off, right? And it's such an icon, not only is it iconic uh, musical, but it's such an iconic piece of New York City. Um, right. And it's such an iconic piece of our culture. Um, and so to be at the reopening of it to kind of help bring Broadway back and to help open up the community again. Um, mm -hmm. And to think about you while I was watching that, I, I think that this shows how your legacy um, and what you've done continues, right? And I hope, you know, and but not only I hope, I know uh, there'll right. be more to come because of the work that you have done. But it's been amazing to watch the representation of Blacks on Broadway currently. I think this season we've had, what, about eight uh, different variations of musicals and Broadway uh, and straight plays that are based on or centered around or written and directed by uh, right. Black individuals. And I can't even imagine um, growing up with that means if I was interested in acting, but also to the transformational narrative of showing us in so many different lights and characters and images. You know, what are your thoughts as someone who has helped, you know, pave the way for to have, you know, eight Black, you know, versions of musicals and straight plays on there? What, what does somebody like you think about that um, while this time of representation? Well, it's very important. I mean, the thing about it is, like, like you said, we had so much of uh, the representation on Broadway this past season. Uh, I just don't want people to 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 leave it at that. I want the you know the conversation is started, but let's continue it. You know, um, and uh, because of COVID, because you know, uh, Chicken and Biscuits, the show I was in, written by Douglas mm -hmm. Lyons, a black uh, a black uh, playwright, and also. Uh, Jalen Levingston, who was our black director and one of the youngest directors ever on Broadway, um, it didn't have the full life that it should have. We were one of the casualties of war because of COVID and everything. So we had to shut down early, but it still made an indelible mark. And uh, it's going to have a life, you know, uh, the tour and also regional theater and things like that. I just don't want people to say, you know, because uh, they gave us this chance, it didn't work out. Because, you know, COVID really, really, you know, actually it made it made its mark and, and you can't really say, well, we gave you a chance, you know, continue this conversation, which I think it is. I think this is definitely something because people are interested in, in knowing other people's cultures now. It's like, oh, I didn't know that was part of your culture. I didn't know. And it's all the same. Uh, our show mm -hmm. was uh, one of those shows that people said, oh, my God. And no matter what faith they were or background they were, they would go, oh my God, that happened in my family. You know, they would come up to me crying mm -hmm. or laughing. So um, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And the representation is very important. Young people are now saying, hey, maybe now I have a chance. So they're starting to write. They're starting to direct. They're starting to have visions of grandeur and, and saying, oh, you know what? Even if I'm not a great performer, maybe I can be behind the scenes. I can be in casting. I can be a, a director. I can I can work in administration, something like that, because I love this the, this industry. I think even that part is so important, what you said about behind the scenes. Um, and, I, and I never realized that until just now. Uh, I have a friend of mine. I'm not going to call them out now because I will reference them a little bit later on. Um, they were just talking about a production that they were participating in. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And the fact of that, the representation behind the scenes wasn't there. And as a result, the representation being behind the scenes, that it was difficult for them to draw in the audience, connect the audience to the work, uh, mm -hmm. because they kept going after traditional audiences, um, not looking forward to expanding the tent and expanding right. the audience to create that new pipeline of audience members who are diverse, diverse experiences and who will be interested in attending Broadway. So that sometimes they need to be reached and marketed differently. It's no different than what Coca-Cola does. Coca-Cola for their can of Coke, they have five or 10 different commercials for the same Coke, but it's in different languages, it's different uh, actors, it's in different time periods and time slots, it's on different networks uh, right. that has a different message. And so I think a lot of times people lose sight of that and the importance of it isn't a one size fits all messaging, right? Just as other consumer product goods don't have a one size messaging, um, that it creates a different thing. So they were just talking about the frustration um, that they had with the lack of individuals behind the scenes. I'll go for, further, Norman, the lack of producers willing to reach out and grab those who could do marketing and PR and then mm -hmm. funding them with that proper budget line item to do the work. No, it's it, it, you're, you, hit the, <laughs> you hit the nail right on the head. The thing about it is like, you know, I'm in a, uh, once the George Floyd situation happened and all the, you know, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey, all of that, everybody was at home in the pandemic and they saw it. They saw it live. Thank God for um, 
for video and cameras and things like that. So people could not get away from it. So you can't dispute what, what had happened. So we started, there's the, what we call ourselves the OGs of the theater industry, the OGs of uh, the black OGs. We got together and we created a, 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 a united front called Black Theater United, BTU. Mm. And so we talked about these issues and we've had several um, uh, things that we've been putting together. And one of them was to have a summit with producers, theater owners, um, uh, creatives, union members. And we created this, what, what was called the New Deal. It's kind of like, you know, I wouldn't, I don't want to say it's the constitution or anything like that, but it is uh, agreements that we have come uh, uh, together, we put together. And there were some, you know, people who didn't agree with everything. And there were some people who did agree with everything. And, you know, but at least the conversation is being had. And like you said, we need people not necessarily on stage to show that diversity, but backstage and, and having the mindset like, you know, what's great right now is President Biden is as is, is nominating a black woman to the Supreme Court. Let's have some diversity in a high position like that. So that way we can have equal sort of, you know, uh, legalities, if you will. Uh, same thing with any industry. Let's have different voices say what they need to say. And because that's what we are, we're a melting pot. I mean, it goes to what you're saying. Because of the fact that everybody's rushing uh, um, to have their post George Floyd moment, um, a lot of people are rushing to, I, would, I, would, I won't use the word rushing. Uh, I should probably say people are intrigued now right. about understanding about the importance of diversity um, and existing and where do they fit in during this post George racial reckoning moment mm -hmm. um, that plays are going up, which is fantastic. And to your point in which I was talking to another group of you know black producers uh, mm -hmm. and directors and, and playwrights and their challenge, Norma has been saying that. And I think that's why I'm leaning into it. I just don't want to never, miss the opportunity to help advance this conversation on behalf Absolutely. of you guys Absolutely. um and it's just that as a result like hey we threw up some place like as you said it didn't work out you know so why should we do it again right and the, the challenge of that is are you setting them up to win or are you setting them up to fail because if you don't have the proper backbone as other straight plays may have mm -hmm. right that has the proper marketing budget that has the pr so let's be honest, you know, and I do work for Disney with ABC. Um, so I am aware that even they are having challenges too as well. We're just in COVID still. We're still in right. a pandemic. So right. they need to do what they need to do to make sure the seats are filled, for even those properties that are heritage properties, right? right. And so why wouldn't a new play um, with a new play, right? Maybe new cast, they need that same support. It, it makes me normally just think about something really interesting. Um, I'm a big fan of history, and uh, there is this resort town. It's no longer, but it's, it's called Idlewild. It's being Michigan, and that's oh, where yeah. all like the black middle and as you know, black middle class mm -hmm. class you go to. But right during the Civil Rights Act, when they passed, the blacks made a decision. Right when they were thinking about doing the infrastructure of Idlewild, sewage, water, pipelines, all kinds of stuff, um, and they said that we must go and be able to populate areas like in the Hamptons, you know, Sac Harbor, the Vineyard, the Inkwell. Um, because if we don't go and populate, then they will say, what did we do it for? Right. Uh, why did right. we even pass the civil rights legislation? Because they, they don't have an interest in coming. And so it just puts me in the minds of this conversation right now is it's like, if you don't give us a proper infrastructure, then they can say, why did we even push to have so many on when it, it wasn't there? Um, to to kind of advance this conversation, I think there's something about, I remember a playwright, Dominique Maruso. Mm -hmm. She just did her play, The Skeleton Crew. Black female player. I went to college with her, full disclosure. Um, and on the insert, she had an insert, Norman. In the insert, she said uh, almost instructions, but she gave instructions to be themselves. She says, if you feel you need to ooh, ooh. If you feel you need to ah, ah. If you feel you need to clap, clap. Laugh, laugh. That she said, I want you to engage and react with the, with, with the cast and with the mm -hmm. actors and make this a dynamic of play. And I thought that was such an interesting way to invite the audience, you know, in, you know, to be part of this transference of energy. But mm -hmm. I think it was also something to say that you are welcomed here, right? right. And right. so right. what is your, what are your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. That was my thought. That's, well, I mean, that's part of my culture. You know what I mean? Like I grew up in the church, so it was always the call and response. So if you felt like saying something, you did, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, 
going to the theater, a lot of times I have to hold myself back because no one else is doing anything because sometimes mm-hmm. I want to say, yeah, or, you know, whatever. Um, but I think sometimes people just need permission when in, in point in case or case in point, I should say case in point, uh, when we had chicken and biscuits audiences, a lot of people, cause there was a lot of Bible, uh, passages and verses that were being said. And some people would say the verses with me because I was a pastor and they knew them. And it was like, that's right. That's right. And then, so people who were not used to that were sitting beside them and they would go, okay, I guess we have permission to, you know, now say mm-hmm. something as well. And so that it kind of grew on the audiences. And that's what we were hoping for to keep cultivating that sort of feeling and atmosphere. But anyway, um, I, I think that's perfect. That's a perfect uh, synopsis of what, uh, what a culture understands. And yeah, if you do want to say, ooh, say, ooh, if you want to say, ah, say, ah. Mm-hmm. What I will say though, don't sing the song with the actor. Like let that the actor part. sing. Yeah, let the actor sing the song. I I was just at um, the Tony Awards back in October this year. They had them uh, at a special time. And Jennifer Holliday came on and Mm. she was singing And I'm Telling You. And it was the first time in a long time that she had been on the Tonys and singing that song. And there was a woman right next to me with her camera out singing the entire song badly, horribly. And I'm thinking, I just want to say, shut up. Like I didn't pay money to see you. <laughs> I want to yeah, see her. Part. <laughs> so anyway, no, no, you're on it. I went to go see um, MJ the musical audience. So what do you uh-huh. what do you say? I'm gonna double down on that. Right. So I went to go see an MJ the musical, and the whole back row, I swear to God, was singing along with every song. And it was only so many times I could turn my neck back. Right. right? And at some point, Norma didn't care about me or my neck. Right. <laughs> Fair. I can't take out the whole back row and tell them to to, to leave. But I mean, it's just a time and a place for that. Like one little word or two, great. Uh, But literally, Norma, they gave me verse, chorus, verse, and they might have even done the bridge. They might have even done the bridge. (laughs) And wrong. Loud and wrong. wrong. Yeah. Loud and wrong. But let me tell you, audience, who's going to be loud and right. Uh, And that is going to be Norman Lewis this Friday coming up. Norman has as a solo performance at Carnegie Hall. That's what I'm saying, Norman. Like, I just think that your career has just been so incredible. Like, the idea that you've been able to play these incredible characters on Broadway and then also, too, to be on screen and then now you're at Carnegie Hall. I mean, you're talking to somebody who is just an untalented musician and by that, I performed in the marching band. Uh, I was in my church choir. So this untalented, right? And so understanding of what is required uh, to be on Broadway and to be on Carnegie Hall. I mean, I can't even imagine um, what is that like. So one, congratulations. Thank you. Um, um, that, and then two, tell us what can we expect um, from this solo performance of yours? Well, you know, I'm honored by that too. And the fact that I'm, I'm at Carnegie Hall, I've performed at this hall many times uh, with other people there were you know there was part of a celebration or something like that and uh so i've been in this hall before but never having my own show and so Ah. what this what this represents is i'm the uh guest of the new york pops steven reineke is the Mm -hmm. the conductor the maestro and he's a friend and so we put together this amazing show uh i do like i come out around four different times within the show there's two acts um, and then, uh, you know, I get to sing a few songs within those four little vignettes. Um, but it's songs that I've done over the years, uh, shows that I've been in. And also the orchestra is going to play orchestral suites, what they call suites, uh, just instrumental. And all of that music is going to be from either a show that I've been in or composers that I've worked with. And wow. so it's going to be a night of just my career, retrospective of my career, and a few little surprises here and there. But for the most part, singing a lot of the songs that I've, uh, you know, that I'm known for. Life isn't bad. I mean, yeah, this, no. this life, life, life ain't bad. Like, li- life blessed. ain't bad. They'll just to be on Carnegie Hall performing multiple times, as you said, but to do your own um, solo performance uh, at Carnegie Hall is 
I mean, is this a dream? I'm so happy yeah. as if it's my dream, right? I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazing, man. Um, can you tell us a little bit of some of the songs or is those all uh, Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's uh, definitely, I'm definitely gonna, you know, music of the night, I have to sing, you know. From, oh my God, you have to. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. Based, I mean, that's right. from the Phantom, it may not be familiar, just in case. Yeah. Right, from Phantom mm -hmm. of the Opera. Otherwise, there'd be a riot if I didn't do it. Uh, oh I'm my God, do, a revolt. But, a <laughs> revolt. Um, uh, also, uh, I got plenty of nothing from Poor Game Bass. Uh, stars from Les Miserables. Uh, oh my God. Uh, Being Alive. Uh, I'm doing that one. I'm trying to think. Ugh. A little bit of a little bit from Once on this Island. A couple little snippets from that, and and uh, Little Mermaid. So it's uh, yeah. Wow. You know. What a blessing. Yeah. Audience, you are in for a treat. Run and go. Uh, see my guy Norman Lewis card go. I cannot. I mean, he doesn't need my validation. Or support. I'm just, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm gonna say, roll it around. Like I, I can't underestimate. I mean, just listen to this man's voice. This is speaking voice annoys me. How smooth and velvety it is, right? Like, aside from my hollow, high pitched voice, no matter what I do to modulate it, I could never get it as smooth. Like your speaking voice is equally as good as your singing voice. You are annoying, sir. Annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I'll, okay. So I'll pay you some more money for that one. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. I mean, for God to bless you with like that type of talent, singing and a speaking voice, the ability to coordinate with your bookshelf. I mean, come on, like this life brain, ain't fair. my life, brain. Life ain't fair. <laughs> 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 Norman, before I let you go, I do have one question because I am curious about that. Like, I've always been interested in voices, and and I'm joking about it. And I'm fine. I had enough therapy. Uh, my audience has heard me talk about this. It was like to be very um, subconscious about my voice. So the irony that I make a living and a career on my voice is God's humor. Um, but growing up, I was not a fan of my voice. Um, really? And so I've always paid attention to voices. Mm -hmm. um, I just accepted my voice as it is, but I've always paid attention to voices. So for you, when did you know that you had something special in your voice, in, in your vocal ability? Uh, when did you recognize that? Because I mean, I want to say, Norman, like, there are certain singers and then there are certain singers who are apart from other singers. And this isn't any um, dismissiveness to, towards other singers, but there's some singers who have such a beautiful characteristics to their voice, whether some of it could be raspy, which is still beautiful, um, whether some of it has range and multiple, I mean, there's so many different characteristics, but yours is sets apart. It is, it's just so smooth and buttery and like and velvety and consistent like it, it, it's an amazing the way that your voice is so when did you recognize that well first of all i'm glad i checked in today listen i, I this you boosted my ego a thousand <laughs> uh, points but um by the way you have a great voice i don't know what that is but i don't know what yeah. you're saying but i'm gonna let you have thank that you. But you have a great <laughs> voice um thank you I would say, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I just knew that uh, the people that I admired uh, growing up for singing were the crooners. And so, you know, Dean Martin and Old Blue Eyes and Nat King Cole and my favorite, Johnny Mathis. Uh, I never tried to imitate them, but emulate them. And so I always wanted to have like this sound when I hit a note to make it the best sound that I could make it, whatever that meant. And then, you know, getting into musical theater, uh, then portraying that and acting that song by saying the right words and the intention, but also trying to make the sound. So it was a, you know, gosh, it's, it's so much going into that. Um, so I've always uh, just wanted to not, I don't want to say sound pretty, but I always wanted to sound the best that I could yeah. uh, uh, when it came to that, because I knew that that would make people feel a certain way. And, you know, it's a gift. Uh, and I know people say that all the time and it sounds so kumbaya, but it's, I'm just, I'm just holding this for as long yeah. as I can. Uh, it's a gift that's been given to me by a higher power and I just try to take care of it. And, and uh, the longer people want to hear it, the more I'll give it to them. <laughs> that, that is beautiful that you recognize your voice. It's, it's interesting you say that. Well, one, yes. And people are always going to do that. And I don't want you to, to rest easy, Norway. I'm not going to call you out like Richard White does to perform on the Mike you show because people got to pay for you since you have That's a right. performance coming up. So don't sniper, the today. sniper. Yeah, the sniper. So those snipers, don't, don't, don't worry about that. So you can rest easy. Um, but I think it's interesting. I always talk about that as if it's my idea or my concept, but we always talk about you know, when someone has an art piece on their wall um, that they don't never actually own it, it is the custodians of it, you know, because when they die, it just gets passed along for the provenance. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And so I think I never heard someone talk about their vocal cords as this their custodian, the vocal cords, uh, and the custodian of their gift. Uh, I think that's a very interesting perspective that you have. And I think that's probably why God gave you the beautiful gift and voice of, of song that you have. So cheers to you, Norman Lewis. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you go see Norman Lewis this Friday at Carnegie Hall for Carnegie his Hall. first solo performance. I mean, this black man just keeps making history even in March. Um, <laughs> exactly. There you go. It's Black History Month every month. Yes, yes. <laughs> Norman Lewis, thank you so much for ever coming to the show. I look forward to having you back as many times as you will be welcome to come back on and want to. Thank you, brother. And listen, we got to get together again. We got to hang out. I would love that. Yes. Let's do I, that. I after, would love that. After March, after March 4th, I can drink again. So let's okay. go. Okay, it's perfect. <laughs> and listen, Martini's on me this time. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Norman, I'll see you soon in the city, baby. All right, bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.